Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Haley. Good morning, Dan. A little sick, Haley. How are I you know. doing? It's just never ending. But Haley one is day. sick. It seems to be the new thing. Yeah. You had a baby. <laughs> that baby brings diseases everywhere he goes, and you get to deal with it, right? Yep. But don't worry. <laughs> Haley, while sick, is mm-hmm. still here. And more importantly, I've got her enclosed in a little plexiglass cube to prevent her from spreading germs to me. Right. The yes, true it's star. like the opposite of a bubble boy. Right. You know? Right. Well, I don't want to be in a bubble. I want to go places. <laughs> but I want you in a bubble so you don't get me sick. Anyway, thanks for being here. You're going to try to lump your way through this, yes. right? Yeah. All right. We've got a lot of stuff planned at the end of the show. We're going to be talking about choosing colors for, I guess, a complicated area in the home. Uh, an yeah, maybe it area. seems straightforward, but I think that stairwells and landings can bring some challenges of their own and maybe they're not always considered. Right. So we're going to talk about that. And even if you don't have one of those places in your home, a stairway with a landing, maybe you've got this unusual spot that you've struggled yeah. with. All of these things will apply to that. We'll also be talking to Brickworks Property Restoration about chimneys, more specifically about chimney sweeping. And normally that's something that we tackle in the fall. Mm-hmm. Uh, but actually, a really good time to do that is right now, because if you do it now, you're going to prevent something from happening over the course of the summer. And it's kind of stinky. You have like, to wait to find out, though. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you more than that. Maybe you figured it out. But if not, hang around for that. So that's coming up. Right now, let's talk about a modern-day paint parable and some lessons that we can learn from it. I love it. All right? So long time ago, several years, a pretty cool guy buys this house. Hmm. All right? Now, the house has some decorative raised plaster edging around the top of the wall in his formal living room. Sure. And then that goes onto the ceiling. So okay. picture that. He didn't pay very much attention to this. It was just there. You know, he was focused on other things. Pretty cool guys have lots of things they got to take care of. And that really didn't figure in to what he was dealing with at the time until his 10 year old daughter, who was pretending to teach an invisible classroom of kids. It's what she did all the time. It's one of the best things to do. Oh, yeah. So she would do that day in and day out. He comes home from work one day to find that she has taped lessons all over the wall. Great big, huge (laughs) poster-sized papers everywhere. She got a ladder out so she could go all the way to the ceiling. Wow. Yeah, it it was amazing. That pretty cool. I mean, I'm assuming it was amazing. The pretty cool guy took (laughs) pictures of all of this, I'm sure, and shared them on social media. It was hilarious until they decided it's time to take all those papers down. And they realized that when they took them off from uh, the area up by that edging, it peeled a whole bunch of the paint away. Well, the pretty cool guy was pretty bummed about that situation. But he knew how to fix it because he worked with paint. So he's a paint expert. He is a paint expert of sorts. So he scraped the loose paint away. He sanded the bare spot. He wiped it clean and then touched up the spot. Everything's golden. Until a few hours later, he noticed that the new paint, which had been spread over the older existing paint, you know, Mm -hmm. along where, where he overlapped it a little bit, that new paint was causing that existing paint to peel as it dried, the surface tension in it. Yep. Well, after some more examination, the pretty cool guy determined that much of the paint on that edging all the way around the entire room wasn't bonded well. So That's a huge bummer. Yeah, the pretty cool guy was pretty bummed. He realized he had a huge mess on his hands and that it was going to take a lot of work to get things fixed. Yeah. Now, in the end, it did take him a long time years to build up the gumption to tackle (laughs) this surface. He had to scrape everything away, remove every little bit of paint that wasn't thoroughly bonded, prime, you know, sand the surface, clean the surface, and then prime the surface and then repaint the surface. All right. That's the parable. That's the story. Now, here's some insight. The pretty cool guy was me. (laughs) That's shocking. What? I know. It was you the whole time? It was me. I kept it a little bit down low, but... It was, you know, and the the girl that did that was Hannah. Oh, my God. My daughter. And anyway, anyway, what did I learn from all of that? Yeah. Here are some lessons. We're going to go through them as quickly as I can. I think they're they're pretty good stuff. It's pretty good stuff. Here's my first lesson, and it's really long, so you're going to have to listen very carefully. Edge closer to the radio. <laughs> Put your good ear towards the speaker. <laughs> good ear. All right. Here's the lesson. Sometimes projects are incredibly straightforward, and you don't need specialized knowledge to accomplish them. Mm-hmm. Conversely, sometimes projects absolutely require specialized knowledge for you to accomplish them. Unfortunately, 
without having that specialized knowledge ahead of time, it's not easy to know which one is which. That's so true. That so, is so true. I think it is. It's long and convoluted, but what I'm getting at is painting the living room for the previous owners seem like a no-brainer. Right. You're just painting a wall. What's there to ask Right. Questions They're not about? painting over rusty metal. They're not painting over PVC. Or it's not plastic. a floor. Like, right. There's nothing crazy. So straightforward. Right. All they needed to do was paint a wall, and they get their paint and paint, right? Yep. Well... Turns out there were questions to ask. You know, there are a number of reasons that the paint failed on the plaster in my living room. You know, in my instance, it's because they didn't use a mist coat or a primer in, sure. in the beginning. Now, yeah. a mist coat is just a watered down version of your paint, and that can be really messy to work with. So, a lot of the time, a good primer is recommended instead. In my case, neither one was used. And I don't know exactly why. I don't know what played in. Maybe the people who did the work figured they had a paint and primer all in one. Mm, you know, that whole yeah. idea. You know, maybe they didn't even think about a primer or a mist coat at all. Who knows? Either way, the point is they had a project that seemed really simple and straightforward, right. but there really were some major considerations that they never realized existed. And so, they didn't really have to deal with the consequences. Well, that that's a, <laughs> another lesson is if you're going to mess it up, make sure you're on that end of the stick, right? Yeah. But a good policy is to bounce your project off the experts every time just yes. to make sure you're not missing something. You know, so at RepcoLite, we're happy to help with all things paint related. Don't think your question is too dumb. No, I really don't think that there are any dumb questions. No, there are dumb questions, sure. Haley, but okay. none of our listeners questions, will have but... them. <laughs> You should always ask them. Ask them. I can't tell you how many times I've asked questions about something that I thought was, you know, I knew the answer. In fact, I was just getting the confirmation. And I realized as I asked the question, oh, the answer is slightly different. I would have messed that up. Ask the questions. You may think you know what you're doing. Right. But my parable is evidence that you can still mess it up. All right. A second lesson. Doing it right is much easier than redoing it and trying to do it right. It's so much easier just to do it right the first it's time. It's not fun to do the prep work. It's not no. fun to take time to prime or to sand or whatever your situation is. I totally is. understand wanting to skip all of those things, and I am guilty of doing that. And I always regret it. Right. So just take the time right off the bat and do it right, unless you're going to leave it for somebody else. And that's not cool human stuff. <laughs> no. So do it right. The last one that I've got, good tools make every situation better. When we were scraping everything down, I had one good putty knife in the whole house. All the other ones were like coated with stuff I never Just cleaned whatever. up. whatever. Yeah, exactly. Oh, what a mess. What a mistake. So the one that I used, it went really well. The kids trying to use these other <laughs> gummed up putty knives didn't work. And this is why we take care of our tools, kids. Exactly. Get the right tools, whether it's good brushes, good paint, whatever. We know it works. And then maintain them and you will be happy in the long run. All right. That's all the time we've got. We, there's more lessons to be learned, but that's enough for now. Three good things. Implement them. You'll be happy. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Brickworks Property Restoration about chimney sweeping and more. That's all next. Stick around. And we're back. You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And with spring really starting to take off, and as we begin to look at summer starting up in a month or so, a lot of us probably aren't thinking right now about getting our chimney swept. It seems kind of like a fall job, something that we do right before winter. Well, right now I'm joined by Jeremiah Campbell, owner of Brickworks Property Restoration in Clinton Township, and we're going to talk about exactly that. Jeremiah, thanks for chatting with me today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. It's an honor and a privilege to come on your show and serve you and your audience. Well, we're happy to have you here. And before we jump into the topic that we want to talk about Let's start with Brickworks Property Restoration. What do you guys do? How long have you been doing it? All of that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So we've been in business. It's our 19th season in business. Uh, we started as a subcontractor back in like 07, 06. Um, it took, in about 2010, I started to take it serious. Uh, I stopped going to college and I, I really started to dive into um, working with my hands. My parents were auto workers. And when I, I saw them getting laid off and I'm like, well, I, I can have my destiny here. I, I could literally design my own life that I wanted to live. And so I got into doing masonry. So I was doing brick and then we got into concrete and foundations. So yeah, we're the largest uh, residential contra uh, masonry contractor in the state of Michigan. All right. And you said you got serious about it in 2010. 
Yes. And what had you been doing before that? College and all of that. I mean, the whole masonry thing, where did that come from? I was 18 years old. Um, so <laughs> uh, 19, I started the company. And so there wasn't much life before that. I was actually painting cars. All and right. so I, I was in the low riders and things like that. And, and I, 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 to be honest with you, I got sober. You know, I got sober at 21 years old and uh, I was at a 12 step meeting and a guy's like, Hey, I want to give you a job. And I was unemployable at the mm-hmm. time. And so then I just literally that, that he, he implanted the seed of entrepreneurship in me by canvassing, knocking doors, boom, boom, boom. Can I talk point to your porch? Um, and from that, I went on to get my builder's license and start advertising. And when I say in 2010, I started taking it seriously. What happened is I did my first advertisement. And I stopped doing canvassing. I did my first advertisement and then I bought a second truck and put a crew in the second truck. And I would, I, that's when I started like, oh, wow, I can actually make this a business. Wow. My goodness. So how far do you guys reach? How, you know, you're in Clinton Township. How much of Michigan do you cover? So if it's one of our preferred clients, we, we travel all over this, the country for some of our clients, AT&T, Verizon, a few of those um, where we do high-end work for them mm-hmm. and they and they call us out so it's regular we have company you know people in cleveland toledo um grand rapids around the area but our main service area is about 75 miles so we'll cover down to monroe up to port huron over to howell and ann arbor is our main service all right well before we're done or once we're off the air i'm going to reach out and i'm going to get some names for our listeners on the west side we've got listeners on the east side and you're perfect for that group if our listeners on the West side want to reach out, you you can give me some names of contacts or people Absolutely. that you feel comfortable with recommending. All right. So we're going to get into this whole chimney sweeping thing. And let's start with, is that explicitly or expressly a fall project? Or is that something that people could be thinking about right now? Yeah. So um, a, a good analogy is, is if you, you know, the, the fall leaves fall, you want to get them off the grass before it does more damage. So inside of a chimney when you're burning, so CSIA, Chimney Safety Institute of America, requires you to do one at least annually. And what we're going to do is when we come out, we do a minimum of a level two chimney sweep. So a regular sweep, you're just going to sweep the chimney out. So, so before I get into that, yes, this is the time to do this because you're going to be better off leaving it clean because you get negative pressure issues and things where the, the house during the pressures of, of your home is going to start pulling air back in from the chimney, depending on how your house is operating. However, if you don't clean that out, you can get smells in your house. You can get, you know, build up. You're going to get water penetration coming down there and it's going to create smells. It's going to create different fire hazards that are going to happen. When you do a chimney sweep, one of the most important part of it is after the sweep, it's the scope. That's when we take a camera and send a camera up the chimney to verify. I would say about 95 to 99% of chimneys are unsafe to use. Well, that's disheartening. 90 to 95, is that what you said? 95 to 99. Oh, you did. Yeah, it was even worse than I was anticipating. I think I dulled it down in my head for my own personal reasons. (laughs) What? Okay, so you're finding that in the chimney sweeping process or after that with the scope. Yeah, so we have, it's, it's NFPA 211 is the code written. So what happens is, is there, if there's any gaps or cracks in an open flame system is the way the code is written. What that means is essentially you have a straw. This is your flue system. So you have your mm-hmm. firebox, your smoke chamber. Your smoke chamber is where your smoke is going to start turbulating. That's where a lot of your creosote is going to be built up on. From above that is your flue system. So if there's any gaps or cracks, what happens is when you build a fire, you're intentionally catching your house on fire is what you're doing. And you're trying to control it. Well, you have a bunch of back when they used fireplaces to heat homes. Most times my customers don't understand that when you put a fire in your house, most likely it's going to, it's going to make your house colder in other areas because it has to draw the air from somewhere, pull it up. Well, Mm -hmm. every one of your, every one of your painting contractors, anybody that's listening, anytime somebody comes out to do any type of exterior home repair, one of the number one things they talk about is energy savings. Doors, windows, siding, roofing, insulation, all of these things. What happens is, is, it, is it suffocates your house and it takes all of the air in your house and seals it shut. Well, if the house has nowhere to get air from, it's going to start sucking it back down the chimney. That's when you see backdraft, back puffing, and you see you know massive damage inside of the home. So There's a pressure change from the firebox to the top of the chimney. And that's why there's two to 10 to three. That's the code to make sure your fireplace, and we do all these things during inspection, is high enough to make sure it's 
pressure. And then there's a temperature change when you have a fire to the top and the heat rises up. So both of those things, if you have a straw and you're eating lunch or you're, you're out at a restaurant and you take your straw and these flues are every two feet and you cut it in about 10 pieces and you take your straw and you put a small little gap, it could be a 16th of an inch gap between your straw. How well is your straw going to work? It's not going to work at all. Your chimney's doing the same. Your chimney's doing the same thing, and when there's gaps and cracks inside your system, air is pulling out and it's drawing it out and it's taking all the creosote, all the embers, all of the sparks into that cavity that you can't clean. You can't clean that unless you completely disassemble the chimney. So you have to make sure that there's no gaps or cracks in your flue system. So you run, you come out and you do a chimney sweep. Mm -hmm. Then you throw the scope down. Yep. And that's when you're finding some of these things. Yep. What in the world kind of fix do you have for something like that? How extensive is the fix? When you say 95 to 99% of the chimneys, I mean, what kind of work needs to be done to get them safe again? Yeah, so there's a couple lines out there. We we are huge. The, the, one of the first ones that came out was a product called Heat Shield. Uh, and so there, we were actually the first one in Michigan uh, certified because you have to be certified to, to buy the product. And it's, it's essentially is, is a foam cutout that fits the exact size of your flu and you drop the flu down. So first, when we sweep the chimney, we're going to identify what type of creosote you have. Um, stage one, two, or three types of creosote. And one, the first one is your normal one is that sooty on the side. Then you have mm -hmm. the tar base, and then you have the, the hardened, shiny stuff. And that's stage three? Yeah, and each one of them has their own hazards. And it's essentially based upon your venting of your, your system, but primarily the water content of your wood. And so a lot of customers don't understand that. A lot of people burning don't understand that. And what happens is, is when we send this, the, after we figure this out, sometimes we have to do a chemical peeling to get rid of the creosote because the new product's not going to stick to the walls of a busted flue. So we, we sweep it first. If we need a chemical clean, there's products that we can put down and it, we pull it up. It's, a, it's essentially a crank that sits on the top of the flue. And then it puts like a cork that goes in the bottom. You dump the product in from the top. As you crank it up, it coats the walls all the way up. Okay. How expensive is something like that? Is that a major expense? Is it reasonable? It's Speak comfort to me. Yes, Jeremiah. yes. So if you're going to do an insert, so the only other option you can have is an insert. You know, inserts are any ranging anywhere from five to 15,000. So that's one of your only other options. To do this on a heat shield, we've, they're usually in the range of 4,500 to 7,500 in that range somewhere to, to heat shield and make your chimney safe. I'm going to use the word safer to use because you're still intentionally catching your house on fire. Right, right. And the thing is, I don't like to hear that, but you know, you're saying you're seeing a lot of chimneys that have issues that are unsafe Correct. in your interpretation or your determination. So not liking the idea of it doesn't change the fact that I got a, a hazard potentially that I'm dealing with. And like you said, we've had the fire marshal here. We've talked to people with who do fireplaces and they bring up the same same topic. You know, you're literally putting a fire in your home and you got to make sure that everything else is aligned perfectly to make sure that it's safe and that you get the enjoyment out of it and don't have to sit there with a lot of anxiety worrying about it. Now, we've covered a fair amount. There is more that I want to cover. I want to get to just some questions I've got about the process. I'm wondering, we're hitting kind of the edge of where I need to take a break. Can you hang with me over a break and we'll just pick it up on the other side? Absolutely. All right. I'll be back in just a minute with Jeremiah Campbell from Brickworks Property Restoration, talking about chimneys, chimney sweeping, and all kinds of stuff in between. That's all coming up next. Stick around. And we're back. You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And I am on the phone right now with Jeremiah Campbell, owner of Brickworks Property Restoration in Clinton Township. Jeremiah, thanks for hanging with me over the break. Oh, absolutely. Now, we were talking about chimney sweeping. I mentioned that it's something... Honestly, I used to think about as a fall project, something that I tackle then. I think it's a really good thing to tackle right now. You talked about uh, getting it in the spring can prevent, you know, in the summer we'll end up with the funky smell, you know, that musty smell that comes in. A lot of that can be cleaned up. I'm, I'm assuming just by reaching out now, I'm potentially beating the rush. If I do have repairs that I need to take care of, I've got time. And you mentioned, you know, the repair thing. You're seeing that a lot of the times when you do this, I, I believe you said 95 to 99% of the chimneys you're looking at 
are unsafe in one regard or another, correct? Correct, yeah, and, and that's due to the way it was built and designed. So we get a, a couple of different calls when it comes to our fireplace or heat shield services. One of them is I've lived here for multiple years. I've never had a problem. Now my chimney's not drafting correct. So we take them through an entire process of what was changed. Did you mm-hmm. did you update the kitchen? Did you put a new high efficiency uh, like a, uh, a range hood in? Did you did you put new bathroom fans in? Did you do something that's got a vent or the, the fireplace is naturally aspirated. And so any kind of venting, even dry, like if somebody takes their dryer from the basement and puts it on their first floor, it's pulling air from different places in the house. So we try to help them figure out if it, is it a, is it a chimney problem or is it a chimney problem plus a pressure problem? And I'll ask them, I'll say, open up one of your doors next to your fireplace, try to have a fire and see what happens. And when you try to have a fire right now, if it's 65, 70 degrees outside, you want about a 30 degree at a minimum difference of temperature from inside the home to outside of the home for a fireplace to be working properly. And then those those change a little bit if your fireplace is in the middle of your house because it's heated all the way up. The whole fireplace is heated. If it's on the exterior wall of your house, it's going to be frozen and cold. So it's going to take longer to turbulate. It's going to take longer to heat up and get the strong drafts going. So a lot of things to know, a lot of things to think about. If you have questions, if you are running into issues, make sure you reach out to an expert, somebody who can walk you through this. A lot of this, it, you know, there's so many things that we can DIY, and then there's so many things that we shouldn't DIY. It's probably one of those things not to DIY, get an expert, make sure you're making the right call. Now we're talking about the chimney sweeping, getting it cleaned out. You mentioned you'll clean it. You're checking, you know, to determine uh, the creosote that's in there, stage one, stage two, stage three, different reasons, different levels of cleaning involved with each one. You put a scope down. I get that part of it. Um, You talked about some of the fixes. And if people miss that, uh, if they do have a chimney problem, you can go back and catch the podcast. Listen to that second segment. There's some answers there or reach out to Jeremiah. We'll get your info at the end. Let's talk about the whole chimney sweeping process itself you know, I guess I'm curious, how often should that be done? I believe you mentioned that code is one annually. time a year. Annually, or at least at a minimum inspection. Level two inspection, the way the code is written, is whenever a property, at a minimum, whenever the property transfers ownership. So no matter when it happens, and a lot of municipalities on the east side, especially in like the 2010 era, when a lot of these houses were going into foreclosure, uh, every time we, I mean, we were super busy because the cities and municipalities started requiring this for them to get their CFO back. And so, okay. yeah, annual inspection. So a lot of these customers will call and and we sweep their chimney. They've had an old cool sweep out forever that hasn't doesn't have the cameras and doesn't have the equipment. What happens is, is I, we have to explain to the customer when the house was built, your house was drafty. It's no longer drafty. It's not going to perform, perform efficiently. And they say, well, why are all of these failing? Because the building codes, when the mason is building the chimney, they, 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 what are they using between the, the, the blue tiles? And what are they using on the top? They're using mortar rather than a non-refractory mortar that's going to withstand the creosote acid build of the, So, I mean, they're built and they we knew that they were going to fail. And that's what you're discovering. That's where you're Correct. saying this 99 percent. It's not yep. just you're making it up because you want to sell something. You're, it's it goes back to the building materials and the codes from way back when these were constructed. Yep. All right. So what does the cleaning process look like? And I guess what I'm after there is how long does it take? What kind of mess do I get in my house? Is that something that I experience or is no, it but- all clean and no, you know, I don't even know you've been there. Yeah, yeah. It's that's a great question. And it depends on how dirty or the last time it was swept. So if you're a burner, so some of our clients, they start a fire in the fall and they don't put it out till spring. It never stops burning. Those customers are going to have extensive creosote buildup. So when we get to the house, a lot of them times will come in there and it's not included in your typical, you know, 250 to $350 price range. We have to clean out the entire uh, ash box all the way down because there's the ash door at the back. They'll start shoving it down. So sometimes we can take eight to 10 hours to clean out one of those one of those systems. Most fireplaces, when we sweep them, are going to be a one to three hour process. Most of the time, we can get to it straight from the inside with rotary whips and cables. And we're able to clean everything out. We bring HEPA vacuums in, in place. We put brand new painter's tarps down. We put plastic down first, then our painter's tarps. It's a two-man crew that shows up. We bring all of our equipment in, stage everything, set everything up, double check the pressure to make sure we're not getting backdraft. Because if you start sweeping a chimney and don't check for backdraft, all of the creosote is going to end up in the house. 
Oh. So if, if that's the case, we have to switch our styles. We'll open up windows, things around this to try to change the pressure, but we'll actually tape off the, the, the entire face and then we'll climb on the roof and, and sweep it from the top. Okay. Okay. So what about if I use one of those creosote sweeping logs? You know what I'm talking about? Absolutely. Those little logs that we burn. Yeah. I use one it, of those. I yeah, don't they don't need work. you guys out there, yeah. right? <laughs> they don't work. So the what, what what they do work is if you only burned those. So if you only burned those, most likely you will not have creosote. So it uses a couple different products inside of it. And so when I got certified in Heat Shield, the gentleman that owned the company at the time was a chemist, and he explained all of those different types of logs and how they burn. They put a couple of products in it. It's essentially sawdust um, with a type of uh, bonding agent that creates a slow burning process. So if you throw a couple of those in, burn for one to three hours, most likely you won't need chimney sweeps, but it doesn't do anything to create. So that's already built up on the existing. It's a, it's a marketing thing. Okay, so that's good to know. What about a gas fireplace? What if that's what I've got? I'm not burning logs. Is chimney sweeping an issue in in those situations? Absolutely. So, so the code, all the codes that I talked to before, it refers to an open flame fire. So we're not talking about glass doors on the front with a with a pre manufactured insert with you know tubing and direct vent and things like that. We're talking about your typical masonry fireplace where you have a remote or a lever that turns the gas on. Mm-hmm. Those are those cause just as many fires as your natural fireplaces because most people don't think. But when you look at your logs, you see creosote built up all over them. And what happens is, is the house because it's drafting dust, things can fly into it, and embers still fly up and cause chimney fires. So it's the same exact code. It's the same exact cleaning process. All right. Well, that's really interesting. I did not expect that. Uh, the last big question I had, I think you've really well answered, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I'm a completionist and it's on my list. Is this a DIY project? Now, I know it can be to some extent because I do, you know, I have done my own, but after everything you've said, I'm sure that what I'm doing by going up on the roof and running this wire ball down through the chimney with a little weight on it and pulling it back and forth, I'm doing something, but I'm missing the the inspection for sure. And I don't even know how much creosote or any of that I'm cleaning off. This is really something that's kind of an expert's thing. Yeah, I mean, you you can do it. I mean, Weekend Warrior, anybody can do it. I mean, I've seen customers send me pictures. They actually took an extension cord and taped their cell phone to the extension cord and dropped it down in their chimney and sent me a picture of it. So it depends on how much how much time you have. I mean, right. cost, cost versus value. I mean, when you when we bring a professional, I mean, chimney sweeping is a lost leader for us to where we go out there because we want the upsell to the customer to fix their stuff the big way. And I make it very clear to my customers, we we come out there to give them the knowledge, we give them the resources and the tools and the financing offers to fix this the right way. Because at the end of the day, I would rather you spend $250 for me to tell you that your fireplace is not safe to burn rather than you do it yourself and God forbid something happened to your family all right. No, nope, that's perfect. I'm going to get your contact information. We're wrapping up here. You do a lot of different things. I mean, you kind of mentioned it a little bit at the beginning, the opening segment, but Brickworks property restoration. I mean, you got a minute. Skim through just a few of the different things you can help people with. Absolutely. So um, we started off just doing the masonry repairs. So tuck cleaning, vertical brick restoration, porch rebuilds, chimney rebuilds. That's about a th- uh, probably about 80% of our business. The other 20% of our business is concrete replacement. So we'll come in, we actually mix and manufacture our own concrete. So we have volumetric concrete trucks. We have the largest fleet in the state as well. And then we do foundation repairs. So we don't sell we don't sell products, we sell solutions. Because we're mason contractors, because we drive helical piers, we're able to give customers, not like the big box guys out there that you see everywhere, we're able to actually give the customers the, 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 the solution that they need when it comes to foundation repair, wall rebuild, basement waterproofing, crawl spaces, things of that nature. Perfect. Brickworks Property Restoration, Jeremiah Campbell, you're the owner. Been doing this 19 years, you said, right? Yep. All right. If our listeners want to reach out, if they've got more questions, they you know, need something that you guys offer, how's the best way for them to get in touch? You can either go to our website at brickworksmi.com or give us a call at 877-MASONRY. All right, Jeremiah, thanks for hanging out with us today. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. All right. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about choosing color for a challenging space. That's all next. Stick around. 
when we talk about finding color a lot, you know, finding the right color, figuring out what is the perfect color for a living room. Right. Trying to work on that right now. Our kitchen, a family room. Bedroom. All of these different spaces. Well, Haley, let's talk about some ways to find the right color for really what's kind of a difficult space and probably a not traditional Space when we talk about finding color. Right. I don't think it's a prioritized space. Right. A stairway and a landing. You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And Haley, yeah, you're working your way through those free color consultations that right. we gave away a few months ago. I gave away five of those. There were five winners, and I've been doing those color consultations in their homes. And yeah, I it's really it's a fun experience for a lot of reasons, but I think it gives us so much insight into problems that people are facing in their homes and what better way for us to solve some of those problems than on air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, you just went through a house where the main room in question, the room that was the biggest struggle, mm-hmm. was actually just a stairway and a landing. And right. Kind of unusual. I thought it was to very get that question. interesting that she chose that space for us to focus on because She's bringing in a color expert to really give her some solid advice, and she's got a ton of projects on her list of to-dos, right? She wants to do the living room. She wants to repaint the dining room. She wants to repaint her bedroom. You know, there's a lot of really important spaces that we spend a lot of time in, but the one that she really wanted to focus on was that stairwell and the landing upstairs in that hallway to the bedrooms and bathroom. And I thought that was really smart of her because... That is kind of just a under-prioritized space that does impact us in a really big way that maybe we don't realize. Well, we move through that to get to any aspect of the house. Right. You know, most of the time, one way or the other. Exactly. And because of that, it runs into all these other spaces. And as we bring more color into some of those spaces. Now, if we've got white everywhere, sure. maybe that minimizes the yeah. concern about the stairwell. And, and all of that. But if you've got other colors in other rooms, you start to how ask the question. Those connections. Yeah. How do you make it flow? And, and I don't think that you leave a space behind when you enter a new one. You're carrying that experience into the next space. So if you're entering your bedroom from a space that doesn't feel good, some of those residual feelings are kind of coming with you. I had a stinky kid once that we could track yeah, through the house like, like that. that. They always left this... <laughs> Residual odor. Oh, my gosh. Right? It's a perfect, yeah. It's kind of what you're That's saying. exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't name the child, so I don't have to apologize too much. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So you're saying we don't leave that space entirely. We carry it with us. And if you don't have the right color. Right. And I think that, again, it's a really smart choice for us to focus on because there's nothing else to really support the design in a hallway or a stairwell other than the pink colors. This isn't a space that's being furnished. There are no rugs. Sometimes on a landing, there'll be some furnishings. Maybe some pictures of the family and the dogs and the wall going up the stairwell. Yeah. Right. This was an enclosed one, so there wasn't a lot of space for, like, artwork going up or, you know, the landing was fairly limited. It was a large window at the top, so there's not a lot of room for extra things that were going to help the space feel like something when you were in it. And... I really don't think just changing the color on the walls is going to give her the impact that she was looking for in that space. You know, one of the things that she said before the consultation was that she wanted it to bring a sense of joy. She wanted there to be kind of an unexpected quality to what was happening there because she really wanted it to make an impact. And, you know, one of the first things that we talked about is that I can't just apply color to the walls And that might not do it because we're not talking about a very dramatic color. She wasn't interested in, you know, like a super dark color because there's an enclosed stairwell. So we've got to, you know, consider the light that's available. And so you're not getting there with like a very super bold, dramatic color. She still wanted something fairly subtle, fairly historic to the home. It was a craftsman home. And so we're looking at, you know, a more muted palette in general So how we're going to make that impact is really not with just the color by itself, but the creative application of that color. So how does the room, this particular part of it, Mm -hmm. the stairway, lay out, you know, paint the picture for us a little bit so we can picture the layout. So in the home, the stairwell is in a hallway that's right off the dining room, and it's not an open stairwell. It's tight. It's enclosed. It's an old home. So it's one of those, you know, fairly steep ones. And pretty narrow. Mm -hmm. And when you get up the stairs, there's a pretty large bank of windows. And then you've got one bedroom that's off to the right. 
and you've also got like a little door that's cut out of the wall um, that was an old attic entrance. Okay. So, you know, there's not a lot to go off of. There's not really a place for you to put like a sitting chair or rugs. There's not a lot of room for artwork on the walls. All right. So a lot of people have something like that, mm-hmm. you know, they're, or they're dealing with a space like that with limitations, so many limitations. Right. You don't have space for furniture, a lot of different things you can't do that you can do in other rooms. Right. Don't have a lot of color options here or, you know, you right. don't have the full spectrum available right. to you because exactly. you do have some lighting issues and it needs to coordinate with whatever's going to happen in the other rooms, right. which haven't been chosen yet mm-hmm. at this point. So what did you guys decide to do and how does that apply to regular people with their situation at home? So, again, I really wanted to focus on the creative application of the color. So what we ended up deciding to do is painting the trim, you know, the banister and the doors and the doorway trim, all a color rather than a white. So that was all going to be done in what's called Queen Anne pink, which is a historic pink. It's kind of got blushy undertones, like a little bit of yellow to it. It doesn't ever lean towards like a kiddish pink. It's like a very sophisticated pink. And we're taking it, you know, a little over halfway up the wall to create kind of a a faux board and batten because it's a craftsman home. She's got some beadboard in the bathroom downstairs that goes up, you know, over at the halfway point. It's one of those board and mounds that probably sits around the 73 or 72 inch spot on the wall. So then you've only got a couple feet before the ceiling. And she could do that either just by color blocking is what it's called when you're just, you know, taping a line across the room and creating that kind of faux impression of that, Mm -hmm. you know, molding being there. Or you could add in, you know, just a strip of molding at the top after you've painted and if you want to take that extra step. But you're not necessarily adding wood paneling to the walls. You're just creating that effect. A visual. Yeah. And so by taking that color most of the way up the walls, we're kind of splitting that really large wall that leads up the stairs because that wall starts at the bottom, you know, goes all the way down to the first floor and then goes all the way up to the ceiling on the second floor. So it's a huge wall and you're almost creating kind of like a water line by splitting the wall up a little bit and kind of creating this elevated space once you come up those stairs. It's not just all of the same color. So there's some visual impact there. And by doing something that's a little bit unexpected on the trim, you're giving that sense of joy. There's some interest created in the space. It looks very intentional in that way. And then what we did for the rest of the wall is opal, which is a off-white that leans towards pink. So you're not using a super harsh white next to the pink where it's really going to look pink next to this white because you've got all of that contrast happening. It was a really subtle shift. So that color goes the rest of the way up the wall and then onto the ceiling. So it almost creates a cap on the room. All right. So you're not breaking up the surfaces so much. There's already one break and there's really not a reason to break again. That's just really distracting to the eye and it doesn't really need to happen. It's just our own expectation that a ceiling should be white. That's the problem. So product wise, what did you recommend or did you not talk about products yet? We talked about product. Um, Scuff X was my highest recommendation for, you know, the lower part of the walls, the doors and the trim. I think that's a product that's going to stand up on all of those spaces and especially an enclosed tight stairwell where you're bringing up laundry baskets and whatever else, you're bumping the walls a lot in that space, and no one wants to have to clean that all the time. So you might as well just use a product that's going to get rid of any scuffs that might happen. And then the rest of the wall up, it doesn't really need to have so much durability. So on that part of the wall, you know, the top portion and the ceiling, we ended up just using one product, uh, Ben, and doing that in the matte finish. Bottom line, if you've got a space in your home that you really are just struggling to pull together, you can't seem to get it quite right, bring your pictures, bring your colors, bring your questions to any Repco Light and let the color experts on staff help you figure it out so you can get moving and get things the way you want them. All right, that's all the time we've got. We're going to have to wrap it up. If you want to catch this one again, you can find it online at RepcoLight.com. I'm Dan Hansen. I'm Haley Johnson. Thanks for listening.